Thank you very much, and I thank the organizers for the, putting on this conference. This is my first crypto conference, and I really enjoy it, and I'm learning quite a bit here. So this is joint work uh, with Ben Fortescue and, and Min Xu Xie. Ben is a postdoc of mine at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and Min Xu is uh, probably somewhere here in the audience, or, oh, I thought maybe you went to the parallel session. But, okay, good. <laughs> Okay, so this is essentially a talk on secret key distillation. Um, and so the setting we have in mind here is that we have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Eve, and they have access to some source, and this source is spinning out X, Y, and Z um, letters to, to Alice. Uh, Bob receives Y, and Eve receives Z. And it's an IID source, so they, they have witnessed and copies of this. And the goal is for Alice and Bob to convert their stream of X and Ys into essentially a perfectly shared randomness that is secret from Eve. Right? So if they have access to N copies here, they, they want to produce M perfectly shared bits. And uh, at the end of the day, they want this to be essentially factored from Eve. So Eve has no information here. And then the rate is, is the, the ratio, M over N, it's the amount of Bit, a bit of key they get per copy of uh, the source. Okay, we want to consider this scenario now when Alice and Bob have access to, some, access to some additional resources. So there's a few scenarios we're going to consider. Uh, the first, is, the most restrictive, is when they're allowed no public communication. So here, just in this diagram, here's the source. Uh, it, Alice receives xn, and she has performed some processing here to, to obtain variable x hat. Bob has y hat. Eve is just sitting along. She obtains zn. And then at the end, they have generated this distribution, uh, px hat, y hat, zn, and of course, they want it close to the, the target distribution. OK, so like I said, this is the most restrictive scenario. Um, we can give them a little bit, potentially a little bit more power uh, in the form of common randomness. So we assume that in addition to the source, there is this other shared randomness that's uncorrelated from the source. Um, and Alice, Bob, and Eve receive W. And so then Alice's processing here is a function of Xn and, and W as well as Bob's. So then uh, likewise, they obtain this, and they want to uh, finally obtain key at the end. Another scenario is one-way public communication. So here in, in this situation, uh, Alice is able to communicate to Bob over a channel that Eve is eavesdropping. And this scenario actually is uh, it's, um, more powerful than this scenario. Why is that? Because, of course, uh, this can be treated as, as the, the common randomness uh, because Eve has access to it. Eve's eavesdropping. OK, uh, and importantly, then, at the end, when, when they the, the distribution should be independent of M itself, right? So we, we now basically, because Eve learns M, uh, then they must, uh, the, the key is, is private from, e, from M as well. OK, and finally, we allow for two-way communication, so interactive communication between Alice and Bob. Uh, OK, so this is, these are the four scenarios where, where Eve is um, nefarious. And then we can consider one where she's actually helping. And in this scenario, uh, Eve is, is being very nice, because not only is she going to communicate to Alice and Bob, but she's going to sacrifice any correlation she has whatsoever. And she says, all right, fine, um, I'm going to help you. And also, I want you to obtain key that's secret from me at the end. So this is the fifth scenario we call the helper scenario. This is also known as private key, because the key at the end of the day is, is private from Eve. OK, so let's just re quickly review some known results on the capacity here. So the first, uh, with, when there's no communication and no common randomness, um, this, this is a, a formula given in, in this paper by Cesar Narayan in, in 2000. And actually, they don't, they consider it, uh, they don't consider in, in this particular form, um, this is implicit in one of their results. And you see that it's given as a, a maximization over uh, auxiliary variables that satisfy these Markov chain conditions. The second scenario where there's common randomness, uh, this has actually not been studied to, to our knowledge. Um, so one of our results is that we're, we're able to compute this here. 
Uh, and then the, the third scenario, which is probably well known to, to most of uh, the people in the audience here, is the, the one-way public communication rate. And if this was uh, given by uh, Ashweed and Cesar in 1993. And if we compare it to, to one and three here, you see that they look very similar, except in three, we no longer have this, this constraint on, on the auxiliary variables. So th this is essentially the constraint that imposes um, the no communication. Uh, the the two-way public communication, so notoriously there's no capacity formula for this quantity here. Um, there are a, a few upper bounds, and probably the most well-known is something known as the intrinsic information. And uh, this is given by the conditional mutual information that is maximized over all variables um, z bar that are generated by, by z. So we think of E, if she has her variable z, she sends it through a channel, and then we, we look at the conditional mutual information after that's done, and we, we uh, oh, sorry, this should be a minimize. Sorry there. Uh, we we want to minimize over all, all channels. Okay, this is known as the intrinsic information, and it's an upper bound on the key rate. Okay, and finally then in the helper scenario, the, the private key scenario, this is known exactly, and uh, this is the conditional mutual information. So in particular, this, this gives um, an operational interpretation to the conditional mutual information. So if you, if you want to say, well, what does this really physically correspond to? One answer you can give is that it's, it's like the helper scenario here. It's, it's the key rate. All right, so the question then that, that we study uh, is when is it possible to attain the conditional mutual information under the various scenarios that I, I discussed? Um, and uh, given the, the capacity formula, the fifth one there on the last slide, uh, this is equivalent to asking, when does an assisting Eve offer no advantage under the various scenarios? Okay, so we begin with the, the easiest scenario to analyze, and this is with uh, common randomness with no communication, but we, all, we do allow some shared randomness here. And so when we studied this, um, a key tool that we used is something known as the common information. So this was introduced originally by uh, Gox and Corner, in uh, 1973, and uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, it actually is, uh, it has a very uh, nice and intuitive uh, characterization. So first is the idea of a common function. So some variable j is, is a common function x and y if uh, you can compute it from x and y independently. So another way of saying that is if we, we take our distribution pxy and we decompose it in this way, so j is, is now uh, r running over this, this variable, and the value of j can be determined both by Alice and y, just by, excuse, Alice and Bob, just by looking at their, at their variable. That's essentially what this is saying. So it's disjoint for different values of y and j. And so then the common information, as defined by, by Gox and Corner, is uh, the, the, the variable j, jxy um, is the common function of largest entropy. Okay, so this is, the, this is the value, this is a variable that both Alice and Bob can compute, and it has the maximum entropy of all variables that they can compute. Okay, uh, and it is unique up to relabeling. That's a nice property of this. Like I said, this has a nice intuitive characterization, and I, I think uh, probably the easiest way to, to see this is in terms of a, a picture here, so we'll, we'll look at a few of these uh, diagrams throughout the talk. And this is just a, a distribution, uh, x and y. And the, the way to interpret this is wherever you see x's, that those are uh, events that happen with some non-zero probability. All the other dots are, are events with zero probability. OK, so you, it, it, the actual numbers don't matter here. What matters is what is non-zero and what is, what is zero probability. So then we can, we can block it off like this. And so this is uh, j, x, y, then it has three values in this, the common information. And the idea is just the following. So when Alice, for instance, looks at her variable and she sees that she has four, she knows that Bob's variables lie between zero and four. So she knows that they lie in this block. There's no possibility for anything down here. So likewise, if Bob sees that he has six, he knows that Alice must be between five and six. So we can circle off that, this, this, uh, this region here. Okay, so like I said, it's, it's nice, nice to, to easy to depict. So then um, our, our, one of our uh, first results is that we are able to compute the, the capacity for uh, 
no common randomness, and we show that it's actually equal to shared common, ra common randomness. So there's no advantage provided for um, in that scenario where they have access to some, some side shared randomness. And actually, uh, it's given this is nice uh, formula here. It's the, the conditional um, common information. So it's JXY conditioned on Z. And this is nice for two reasons. One is that it, it simplifies and in, improves um, the Cesar and Narayan result that I cited earlier. So remember, they, they had this uh, max, maximization over auxiliary variables. Um, and actually, we can just show that you don't need to, to do any maximization. It's just given by this. And also, uh, we are able to consider the, the common randomness, uh, which isn't explicitly done in, in this formula here. OK, so uh, then the, the question, though, that I, that I asked in the very beginning is we want to determine what distributions are able to attain this key rate of the conditional mutual information. So given this here, we basically ask when is this quantity equal to ixy given z? OK, and so we were able to solve this. And we, we identify a, a specific class of distributions. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll describe this a bit. It gets a little technical, but it's, it's, it's still fairly intuitive. And so the idea is now we introduce a new quantity known as the conditional common information, which we denote in this way. Um, and so the way to think of this, this jxy given z, is now, now we have a third variable z. And so we, we look at the different conditional distributions. So here's when z equals 0, we draw our plane. When z equals 1, we draw our plane. And then we compute the common information for uh, each of these planes. So th these are the conditional distributions. And yeah, can compute it. So when z equals 0, we have these, these two blocks. When z equals 1, we get, get these three blocks here. OK, and so you can see that if you just look at this particular example, um, if, if we look at the, the 1, 1 event, so in the different planes here, uh, there, there's a, the situation is that Alice and Bob are not able to determine whether uh, the event 0, 0 occurs in the same block unless they know the value of z. OK, I'll say that again. So if, if for instance, when z equals 0, they know that, that uh, 0, 0 is in the same block as 1, 1. Right? When z equals 1, they're in different blocks. But if they don't know what z is, they don't know whether this event is in the same block as that event. Okay? And this is, this is important. So this is some sort of information that they, they don't have access to, that Eve has access to, because it's, it's conditioned on, on z. So we wanted to try to capture this. And that's what, what this, this class of uh, distributions that we call uniform block independent. So it, we say that a distribution is uniform block independent if Alice and Bob can compute jxy given z for all values of z. More formally, we can, we can write it as this, is that th this variable is a function of, of the common information. And also, there's another condition, is that within each block, Alice and Bob are uncorrelated. So what do I mean by block? I mean, if we, if we look in here, and we just look at the, the distribution here, we want that to be uncorrelated. We don't want Alice and Bob to share any correlations except the block number. And in terms of a decomposition, it means that we can take, a, take our, our distribution, pxy given z, and uh, conditioned on z and, and j, x and y become independent. OK, so these are the, the, the two conditions. Um, and maybe it's, it's easy to just look at some examples to, to understand what this is. So the first is this is not uniform block independent. And the reason it's not is, again, because it has this property that um, if, if we look at here and here, the event 1, 1 is in the same block as 0, 0 in both of these. But over here, it's not. It's in a different block. So Alice and Bob are, are unable to determine uh, the value of, of jxy given z simply by looking at, at their variables. OK. Here's a, another example uh, that is not uniform block independent. Uh, here, they are able to determine the block number. But the problem is over here, this one, within this block here, they share some additional correlations. So they're not uncorrelated within this block here. So this is not uniform block independent. But an example of a distribution that is is this nice one here, because they're able to determine um, their block number. And also within each block, they share no additional correlations. OK, so um, it turns out that this 
the distributions that have this property are exactly those that, that give us this, this nice um, key capacity result that it's equal to the conditional mutual information. Okay, so that is the, the no communication scenario. Uh, now we move on to, to look at the, the one-way public communication scenario. So again, we'll just be considering scenarios where Alice goes to Bob, but you just switch variables if you want to go from Bob to Alice. So recall uh, the, the, the capacity formula, uh, which is the single letter characterization here. And so what you can do is you just play around with uh, the chain rule a little bit and massage some variables. And you can write this, the, the right-hand side here, uh, in terms of the, the condition of mutual information. And what we, you see is that you have these, these three terms here, which are, are uh, non-negative. So in order for this to be an equality, we need those three terms to vanish. OK, so then so we have that this is equal to this if and only if there exist variables uh, u and v that satisfy this Markov chain condition and also uh, vanish, uh, the, such that these, these three uh, information terms vanish. OK, so when can we find distributions that have that? Um, well, we weren't able to completely give a nice clean answer to that result, but we are able to give a somewhat clean answer uh, in terms of a strong necessary condition. Uh, and so a distribution will have that the capacity is the conditional mutual information. Um, if uh, we are able to find, um, if there's any event that uh, has some non-zero probability for Alice and non-zero probability for Y in different blocks, then the, the probability of the joint event must be zero. And if that doesn't hold true, then the capacity is not equal to the conditional mutual information. OK, so again, I mean, it's probably easier just to, to see this by an example. And, and so here, if we look at this distribution, OK, so first we go to, to the z equals 1 plane here. And we have these two nice blocks here. So you see that in the z equals 1 plane, there's Alice has some probability, or excuse me, y, Bob has some probability of, of 1. Alice has some probability of 1 as well. So what that says, the theorem says then, is that this event, 1, 1, should be 0, right? That's what that component says there. However, if we go to another plane over here where z equals 0, uh, we, we see that, that there is a non-zero probability of, of the 1, 1 event there. So what our theorem tells us then is that because uh, there's this hole does not exist in every single plane, every single conditional distribution, um, this tells us that actually we cannot attain uh, the, the upper bound at a key rate. OK. Um, so this theorem, like I said, this is a necessary condition. It's also sufficient if the Alice and Bob, their, their support or um, uh, rather their, their range is the same for each uh, conditional distribution. So the only time that this, this theorem doesn't quite give us a, a sufficient condition as well uh, is when you have distributions where um, when, when z is one value, Alice's range is something different than when it is another value and vice versa. OK, um, so, so moving along onto the, uh, the two-way public communication. And it, it's, it was probably a bit uh, too much to expect that we could, uh, could answer the result completely, given the fact that we don't know the capacity for two-way secret key distillation. Um, uh, nevertheless, we, we are able to get a, a nice necessary condition. And it's, it's based off the intrinsic information. So again, this, this should be minimized here. I just copied it incorrectly from the, the first slide. Uh, and the idea is, is the following. OK, so we know that the intrinsic information upper bounds the, the two-way key rates. And in particular, um, uh, an upper bound for the intrinsic information is the conditional mutual information. OK, so then the idea will be uh, that th this is inequality only if, if, uh, if there doesn't exist a channel that uh, for E for which um, we're able to decrease the conditional mutual information. So if we're able to construct a channel for Eve such that this holds true, then, then clearly this is not equal, given this uh, chain of inequalities here. So that was, that was the idea that we, we wanted to try to exploit. And we wanted to try to construct channels for Eve um, that, that decrease the conditional mutual information. So the question we ask is, what sort of distributions allow us to do this? Okay. And uh, so we are able to identify uh, quite a large class, actually. Um, and 
I won't go into the, the, too many details here. These are all given in the paper. But basically, uh, we're able to, to show, we introduce this, this um, relationship between two distributions that, that we, uh, ident we label by this, this uh, arrow here, this dark arrow. And it, it satisfies some, some properties. And uh, it turns out that if, if you look at any two conditions, if you have a, a distribution PXYZ, and if you look at any two of the conditional distributions and they, they satisfy this a relationship that, that we identify, uh, then that is sufficient for the, the capacity to be less than the conditional mutual information. Okay, so I know I, know I glossed over exactly what this relationship is, um, but it, it's probably easy just to give an, some intuition with an example. Uh, and, and so the first is that if we were to mix an uncorrelated distribution with a perfectly correlated distribution, and then we give Eve the, the val we tell Eve which, which distribution is which. Okay, so Eve knows which one is uncorrelated and which one is perfectly correlated. So for example, if it's, if it's a three by three distribution, uh, when z equals zero, they, they're, they're perfectly correlated. Uh, when z equals one, it's, it's, they're perfectly uh, uncorrelated here. And uh, you can apply our, our, our theorem to this. And the, the, theor the theorem is actually, the spirit of it is very similar to the one-way scenario where you want to try to identify holes in your distribution um, where it's such that in one plane you don't have a hole and in the other plane you do have a hole. By a hole, I mean a non-zero event, but it, it actually is a hole when you draw it like this. Uh, and, and so for in this particular example, you can always find a hole when it has this, this, uh, this form of a correlated distribution with an uncorrelated one. And so this is sufficient using our theorem to show that the, the two-way capacity is less than the conditional mutual information. Um, another nice example is when the, 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 the size is small. So when Alice and Bob's um, variables range over just 0 and 1, they're binary. Um, then this, this whole theorem, we don't even need to introduce this, this notion of the, the, the arrow, black arrow. Uh, we just have that if you can find a hole in between any two conditional distributions, um, then, oops, uh, then you have that the, the key rate is less than the conditional mutual information. Okay. So uh, this is, there's still ongoing work to try to, try to sharpen this a bit, um, because this is, this is a, a, a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Um, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, this is able to, to, to prove quite a nice uh, number of instances that, that actually uh, your, your rate is below the, the helper rate. Okay, and so then uh, another thing that we considered in the paper is communication dependency. Um, and so we wanted to know when does uh, the direction of communication matter, matter for optimal key distillation. And we also wanted to know when the number of exchanges matter. So the, the first example that we have here um, is a, a distribution where Eve's variable is, uh, runs from 0 to 2. And uh, if you recall, this is one of the things we showed, uh, that you can write the, the one-way capacity in, in this form here. And in order for, for this to equal the conditional mutual information, these terms must vanish. OK, but it's, it's not a very difficult thing to show if you analyze this particular distribution that you can't find variables u and v that not satisfy this Markov chain and also cause these information terms to vanish. OK, so that, what that tells us then is that the, the one-way key rate is less than the conditional mutual information if communication is from Alice to Bob. However, it's very easy to see that you can actually attain it if the communication is from Bob to Alice. And the reason is because uh, the only place where they have correlation is when z equals 0. Right here, there's, there's no correlation in these planes. And Bob's able to determine that just by looking at his variable. So if it's 0 and 1, he announces to Alice. And then great, they know they have a, a, a shared bit. Uh, if it's 2, they just discard it. And that happens with probability 1 third. So um, this is just a, a very quick example to show that the communication definitely does, that the, the direction of communication matters if you want to attain uh, the optimal key rate. OK, um, another example then is there, there are distributions that require two-way communication to attain the conditional mutual information. And this is essentially a, an extension of, of the previous example, um, except what we do is, is we add a few more terms for, for Eve uh, and then we just permute it. So this is, uh, now Eve has, her range is five, and uh, we, switch, we switched it. So here, for three, we just swapped Alice and Bob's one variable, and uh, for two and four, we swapped, again, Alice and Bob's one variable. 
So you can run the same argument, and uh, then you can show that the one-way rates are less than the two-way rates. OK. So just to, to um, wrap up here uh, and discuss some conclusions in future research, so we were able to, to compute the capacity formula uh, for no communication and shared randomness. An open question is, what if you allow a, a sublinear amount of communication? Um, does that strengthen the, the, the key rates? And this is a scenario related to something known as the entanglement of purification in quantum information theory, which I won't get into, um, but it's, it's motivated from, from quantum information. Uh, and another thing is that we were able to, to, to deduce uh, that the, the, the question of when the, the key rate is equal to the condition of information for one-way communication is just done by single copy analysis, right? Everything here is just single copy. Can the same be done for two-way, right? Do we need to actually consider n copies, the structure of those distributions, or is um, one copy analysis sufficient? Uh, and then finally, um, we, we would really like to know for when the, the two-way rate is equal to the intrinsic information, right? We consider the condition mutual information, but, but you can strengthen that and say when, when is it equal to the uh, in, intrinsic information. And this, this question is, is motivated by a, a related paper of ours on a topic called secrecy reversibility. This is actually what motivated the whole project here, um, was this question here. And I won't get into it, but there are details at that, that paper. Uh, it's an, an analog to entanglement and reversibility. Okay, so I thank you very much for your time.